I want to speak to us in a few moments we have together this morning, continuing our series we started last week. And I spoke to us and laid a foundation, speaking to us about that you might have life. I want to really just speak into someone's spirit this morning, someone's situation. As I was preparing this week, I really just, the Holy Spirit just put a, you know, a burden on my heart to say that sometimes we sit in church and we hear what the pastor says, but do we really understand and receive or, or really, really fully understand what, what is being said in God's Word? And I want you to open up your spirits this morning because I want to speak into your spirit, man. I want to speak into your intellect. I want to speak into your spirit, man. Because sometimes we under circumstances, we got situations that push and press us, which is normal in life. And Jesus said, in this lifetime, you'll be challenged. But I've come that you might have life. You'll overcome, but I've come that you might have life. And so our scripture verse, John 10, 10, the Bible says, the thief comes only in order to steal and to kill and to destroy. <clears throat> but I've come in order that you might have life and have life in all its fullness. Listen to what the Bible says. The thief comes only but to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come in order that you might have life and that you might have it in its fullness. We're speaking about this life is the Zoe life. Super abundant in quantity, super abundant in quality. Now we speak about the resurrection life. We had Good Friday recently, Resurrection Sunday. But this life that the Bible speaks of that you are entitled to, that you can receive by faith, this life is a life that infuses the inside of a human being. We have this treasure, Paul says, in earthen vessels. It is a privilege to carry the treasure of Christ in us, the Spirit of God, this life. Don't confuse being alive with having life. Because many people are alive, but they don't fully have the life of Christ. You can be alive, being born into Adam, but until you're not born into the last Adam, Christ, you don't have this super abundant Zoe life. This is, a, this is an advantage you can have on this earth. I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance. The resurrection life of Christ, the ability to raise things in your spirit, to raise things that are dead in your, in your, in your natural life, to speak into situations that seem as though it's impossible. This is the life we speak of. To run your business, to run your marriage or to be married, to understand life, God gives you an edge. He gives you His spirit. And He says, I've come that you might have this life. So the gospel is not a message of dying, but a message of living. Listen to what I'm saying this morning. The gospel is not a message of dying. It's a message of living. The Bible does not say, I've come to give you death. The Bible said, I've come to give you life. The, the Bible says, through Christ's death and resurrection, we now have life. Yes, we die once when we believe. But the Bible says, we don't live a life of trying to die. We live a life of trying to live. Why? Because you've been given life. I've come that you might have life. Can you say amen this morning? and give Jesus one more shout of praise all over this place this morning. So the, the gospel is a message of life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, and that He made you, a, and you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were dead in our trespasses in our sins before we understood what Christ came to do for us. We were dead in our sins. The Bible said He made Christ who knew no sin to become sin for us. So God in heaven is not sin conscious. God in heaven is son conscious. He sent His Son to do something, to live a life of purpose so we can live now, live a life of purpose. We've been given life for a life of purpose, amen. There is a reason why you are alive. There is a reason why you're sitting in church this morning. There is a reason why you uh, encountered Christ when you did. I encountered Christ on the 31st of May, 1992. is the day that I heard about the gospel fully. I understood it and I received Christ into my heart. To as many as received Him, He gave them the right to become sons and daughters of God. He gave you the right to have this life. You have the right to life. You have the right to have this life. I've come that you might have Zoe kind of life, that you might have resurrection life. So the gospel is not a message of limitation, but a message of liberation. Sometimes we think religion wants to limit us, what we can't do. The Bible is not a message of limitation. The, the, the gospel is a message of liberation. I've come that you might have life, because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Now it doesn't give us freedom to do what we want in the natural, in the sense of breaking all the rules in our country, you'll be arrested and you'll go to prison if you break natural laws in our country. But in your spirit man, in the inner man of who you are, Paul says our outer man is perishing, but our inner man is becoming stronger every single day. And the thief comes only but to steal, kill and destroy on your outer man. He comes to, to talk to your outer shell, this, this physical body. He likes to, 
to put you in under circumstances. We always speak about that under omstandigheden gaan dit goed. Under circumstances, I'm doing okay. No, you're not under circumstances. You are under the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got life and life in abundance, and you have the ability to overcome because He has overcome. So the gospel is not a message of limitation, it's a message of liberation. And I want to say to you this morning, child of God, you have the right to life. Live, child of God, live. Life, child of God, you have life. Live, child of God, live. Don't allow the enemy to steal, to kill and to destroy what God is doing in and through your life. Come on, if you believe that this morning, give Him a shout of praise all over this place. So the Gospel is not a message of God using His Word as a witness against you, but God giving you His power to be a witness for Him. Listen to what I'm saying. The Gospel is not a message of God using His Word as a witness against you, but God giving you His power to be a witness for Him. You see, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 31 verse 24, So it was, when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, Ten commandments Moses was given. And then they expounded these laws to 603 additional laws. Listen to what the Bible says. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, 613 ways in which you have to be perfect. 613 ways in which God is going to love you. 613 rules and regulations that you have to keep in order to be made right with God. If you broke one of these rules or regulations, you were guilty as sinner and you had to wait until the day of atonement one day in the year when the priests would take animal blood they would bring the sin offering of Israel before God the day of atonement atone at one there was only one day in a year where you could be at one with God that was the day of atonement and that's when the Israel felt vindicated when they felt loved when they felt accepted when the high priest would blow the shofar and say God has accepted our blood offering of an animal and the Bible says God, Moses, who implemented this law into Israel's rules and regulations of religion, the Bible says when he wrote these words of this law in a book, when they were finished, notice, he finished writing the laws in a book, that Moses, verse 25, commanded the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it beside the ark of the covenant. Put the, the, the law of Moses beside the presence of God. Listen, uh, of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. So the law was put there to be a witness against the things you did right or wrong. If you broke the law, you were guilty. But listen to what the Bible says. In Christ, the rules change. A new commandment I give unto you. Why? Because the Bible said Christ is the end of the law. The law is still very much alive, but it's not applicable to those who are in Christ because Christ said it is finished. Moses said, I'm finished writing the law and Christ said it is now finished. No longer does that law have to work against you. It is now God's power towards you. God loves us. It's the love of God toward us, not the judgment of God, not the wrath of God towards us. Come on, that is some good news this morning. It's no longer God against us, but God is for us. Paul the Apostle said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who or what can be against us? Acts chapter 1 verse 8, listen to what your Bible says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, life, you shall receive the power of life. When the Spirit of God comes upon you and you shall be a witness to me, for me. So the Bible says the law of Moses served as a witness against us, but the Spirit of God now makes us a witness for Him. We're there to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ, what He has done for us. Can you say amen this morning? So God is not a God who is out to get you. God is not a God of judgment. God is not a God who's out to punish you. The Bible said He made Him who knew no sin. He put all of judgment and punishment upon Christ. And to as many as received Him, to as many as believed in what He has done for us, makes us right with God, that you now may receive this life. And when you live your life, you can live your life to the max and to the full, knowing that we don't fear the day of judgment because God is for us and not against us. God is not the God of the swivel chair. He doesn't turn His back on you today and face you tomorrow. No, the Bible says we boldly come to the throne of grace every single day and we cry out Abba Father we have a loving Father who wants to be in relationship with you wants to walk with you and wants to deposit life into you come on family that is some good news this morning give him one more shout of praise all over this place this morning so I'm going to
many Christians, I lived there for years, always believed that God was out to get me, even though I was born again. I was saved and I thought, man, if I make a mistake, surely God's going to get out to get me. I mean, I was at a one stage in my early Christian years when I used to think if things go wrong, it must be because I've done something wrong. So surely God is he's busy teaching me a lesson. He's busy trying, He's punishing me. When I got sick, it must have been, I must have opened a door for sin somewhere. If I got, now, please, there's natural foolishness. If you do foolish things, there's consequences to our natural actions. But we can't always equate that if something goes wrong and I'm a child of God, God is out to get me. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says no longer does the law serve as a witness against us. The Bible says the life that God came to give you, you now become a witness for Him. We have to be light and salt for Him. We have to go out into the world. He's the light of the world and He his light shines through us so we can tell people about what he did but I want to say to you this morning if you're a businessman and you're going through some difficult times your cash flow issues or you're going through some 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 uh, you, you're not where you think you should be or you're battling in some area don't look for a demon under every rock don't think it's the devil trying to do everything sometimes it's just common sense just read a book Attend a seminar. Go ask somebody who's successful in business to help you become a better businessman. But it's not God who is trying to bankrupt you to teach you a lesson. God does not give you, a, does not give you cancer to teach you a lesson. No, my, my brother, my sister, you have to change your perspective of who God is. I've come that you might have life. Not that you might have punishment. Not that you might have death. Not that you might have sickness. Not that you might have depression. I've come that you might have life. But the thief comes only but to steal and to kill and to destroy. So God is spirit and the true worship is worship in spirit. So the minute you try to approach your Christian work, walk in the natural only. That's what religion does. They say do signs on your body or they do, it's, everything's external. Jesus comes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and He says, look at you people. I mean, Moses didn't have all these clever things and over time they added to religion. Now they've got all these, the phylacteries. He says, you've got these garments. The high priest wore this color. This priest wore this color. They had all these ornaments and bells and pomegranates on the bottom of their, of their dresses. And they had these, he, these, head, uh, these, these uh, head garments on. They had staffs. They had all these different things because it indicated the external religious acts of humanity. It indicates how holy you are based upon your obedience towards being trying to be a good person. Now, are we trying to be good people? Of course we are. But it's no longer about how good we are in our natural man. It's about what Christ has done inside of us and what Christ has given us. He came to fulfill every requirement of that law that Moses wrote that was finished. He said on Calvary, it is finished. Meaning what? That no longer do you have to live under the sway of guilt and condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. Pastor, are you giving people a license to sin? They were sinning quite well before I made that statement. Paul writes in Romans 6, can we use grace as an excuse for sin? He says, certainly not. Don't change my words, says Paul. Don't twist my words. He says, you need to understand what Christ has done for you. Because once you understand that, you'll stop trying to finish what Christ already has finished. People are trying to finish what Christ already has finished. I must know He has. Listen, listen to what the Bible says. The old covenant was performance driven, but the gospel is purpose driven. So you have to perform. On a scale of 1 to 10, we always like to say, I, I say it as well. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate this or how would you rate that? On a scale of 1 to 10, 9 being this or 1 being that. You know those, docu those forms you fill in online? That's the same thing when it comes to the 10 commandments of Moses. On a scale of 1 to 10, how did you perform this last week? Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It's, it's a, the Bible says it's a ministry, Paul calls it a ministry of death and condemnation. Because when you can't keep up to the perfection of that law, we start to live lives of guilt and condemnation. Now we start to change our theology to suit our circumstances. God, the Bible must be saying this, or God must be trying to teach me this lesson. No, my brother, my sister, I'm here to tell you this morning. I've come that you might have life. I became sin for you so you could be made right with God. You didn't have to die. I died on your behalf so you could be made right. I became poor that you could become rich. Pastor, but I mean, you must be careful now. You don't be labeled as a prosperity preacher. I'm going to show you this morning what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The purpose scripture of Christianity. I've labeled this Luke 4, 18 and 19. I believe this is a Christian's purpose scripture. If you want to know what your purpose is as a, script, as a Christian, read Luke 4, 18 and 19. Two verses in your Bible. Luke chapter 4. It is your purpose-driven scripture verses for your Christian life. Listen to what the Bible says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has. I love that. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has. Notice the Bible does not say the flesh of the Lord is upon me because I must. The Bible does not say the law of Moses is upon me because I must. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for He has. He has what? Well, find out what He has done and then you'll be able to live in rest and freedom. But if you don't know what He has done, you live a life of I must. Now sure, we must do things as Christians. But until you don't have a basic understanding of what He has done, you're always going to live this yo-yo Christian life. Loves me today, does not love me tomorrow. Loves me today, does not love me tomorrow. No, my brother, the Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has. The Spirit of the Lord. Moses had no spirit. That's why when King David fell into sin with Bathsheba, the first thing he prayed was, take not your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit came and went in the Old Testament based upon your performance of keeping the law. It was a burden. So when Christ says in Matthew chapter 19, come to me all of you that are burdened and heavy laden, He's speaking to the Jews saying, you Jews that are trying to live these holy lives of perfection under the impossibilities of the 613 requirements, He says, come to me. And I'm going to give you eternal rest. Why? I'm going to give you inner rest. Because I'm going to send my spirit. Pentecost, we're going to celebrate in a few weeks' time. Good Friday, death. Resurrection Sunday, life. Pentecost, 50 days later. So Pentecost was a, it's a Jewish celebration. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a Jewish celebration. Pentecost, 50. 50 days after Easter, Resurrection Sunday. So we say we're Pentecostal. Well, whatever that means, it means that God's Spirit has been sent to us. He pours out His Spirit. Joel said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit. The difference between trying to live an external religious life of behavior versus understanding the deposit of the Spirit of God in us changes the rules. Because God is Spirit. And the true worshipers worship in Spirit and in truth. And I will send you a helper. John chapter 16. I will send you a helper, the Parakletos, and He will guide you into all truth, not into all deception, not into all punishment, not into all judgment. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. So if He's going to guide you into all truth, He's going to guide you closer to Christ. And He will teach you of my ways. He will reveal me to you. Because Jesus was on the earth for 33 years. We are 2,000 plus years after Jesus' physical life on this earth. We didn't spend time. We didn't have the privilege to touch Him. We didn't have the privilege to eat with Him. We didn't have the privilege to ask Him a question. So Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So many spiritual or Christian orphans, they think that they're alone. No, you're not alone. Because you have the Spirit of God. You have this life. You have this deposit in you. Paul says it's a, it's a treasure. It's a treasure. It's a privilege that God would take your human temple, your fallen human sinful piece of flesh that's going to go to a box one day cremated or it's going to be eaten by the worms that he would deem it a privilege to go to you to me this guy me Paul says of all the sinners I'm the greatest I, he says who can God a man fat so act Paulus what a a God's laster in the man was I was a persecutor of the church I set up meetings to catch Christians and murder people. I had a murderous, hardened heart. And God comes and he, I have an encounter with God. That's why every single human being on this planet needs to have their own personal encounter with Christ. You can't try and serve God through your parents or through religion or through someone's second hand revelation, through your wife or through your husband. You, sir, you, ma'am must have your own personal encounter with Christ. Now, notice this. The Bible says that, well, I'm telling you that there's no miracle in Scripture is repeated twice. No miracle in the Bible that you read is repeated twice. Did you know that? So sometimes we read a story and it inspires us in the Bible and we go, will I also have my Damascus Road experience? Well, you, will, you might have a, an experience somewhere, but you're not going to have the same experience as Saul had on the road to Damascus. Why? Because that was Saul's journey to salvation. Your journey to salvation will be unique to you. 
I woke up one morning with a hangover in my parents' house after drinking uh, Captain Morgan and Coke profusely the night before. I had a, 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 my head was banging and I woke up and Pastor Ed Rabbit from Hatfield Christian Church those years was on television and he was preaching and he spoke into through that television. I walked into the lounge at that time. I heard what he said. It's almost like this, this, this feeling came over me. I went, I must change my life through the words the man spoke. Because the Bible says people hear through the foolishness of preaching. So what I'm saying to you might sit, you might receive it as A, but the person on that side of the room is receiving it as B. And the person over there is receiving it as C. Because the Bible said it's the manifold wisdom of God. It's the unsearchable riches of God. It's, you look at God's Word from different angles. You look, at God's, you look at it like this and you say, well, that's what I believe. But this person is in this situation and they look at it from this angle and it means something totally different to them. Same scripture verse. It's this incredible, unfathomable mystery of this most powerful message any human can hear is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, Paul says, I, I, I can't understand how God would take me, a, a failed Jew, an intellectual Jew, but a failed Jew when it comes to understanding who this person is. And Paul writes through most of the letters he writes to the churches. I want to know Him. He said, I preach Christ crucified and Him only. He said, I want to know Him. In the fellowship of His sufferings, I want to try and understand what it took to suffer for me so I could be free. Not that you must suffer. I want to understand how He suffered so I can get a full understanding of what the gospel really means. And I want to understand Him in the fellowship of His sufferings and in the power of His resurrection. There it is. The power of His resurrection. There is a power that is available to every human temple that walks around on this planet when they believe and they hear the gospel. The Bible said and God will take this incredible power, the same Spirit that raises Christ from the dead. He says, I'll place it in you. And Paul said, I don't understand how God can use me as Saul who became Paul. And now God deposits this wisdom into this man. He writes three quarters of your Bible. This man who was a murderer and a persecutor of the church. Why? Because Saul received life. And when Saul received this life, everything changes. Suddenly, things that are in the natural only now make sense in his spirit man. Things must talk to your spirit man. Paul writes to the church in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, I has not seen your natural eye. What can your natural eye see? When I got to 47, I started to see, but the, the, the words on the page started getting blurry. By the way, Pastor Russell Evans told me that one day, he went to an optometrist in Australia and the guy said, at 47, everyone's eyesight gets weaker. Just depends how quickly it gets weaker. And I went to the restaurant one day and I saw nothing. I didn't know what it was, it was my sight. So we, we, we see the natural, and it, our natural outer temple is busy. It's busy perishing, says Paul. It's getting weaker. Not because you're bad, it's because that's the process. Imagine if we all lived forever on the earth. We do live forever in eternity because the Bible said He's come to give us eternal life. So there's a season here and then there's eternity there. But you can't get there until you accept Him here. Now, we've got this natural life. So Moses only writes the law in the natural. Paul persecutes in the natural. And suddenly he has this encounter on the road to Damascus. And the Bible says what? He sees, he hears and gets an instruction from God. That's what God has to do. You have to see Him spiritually. How do you see Him spiritually? He knocks at the door of your heart and He opens up your heart. Because He comes and He resides in your heart. But Romans 5 says what? That the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So you actually, if you're a born again Christian, you actually want to love more than hate. You actually want to forgive more than, than walk in, in, in unforgiveness. You actually want to do good more than bad. Why? Because the love of God has been poured into your heart. So He's busy with the good work. But if you assess everything according to the natural, you become religious. And the way in which religion was promoted was through external garments of promotion. So if you do well, look at school systems. Look at university systems. Look at the economic systems. We build our lives around this performance-based life. And we become, our identity starts to become, um, we start to identify ourselves based upon our human performances. And we do the same with God. When we don't feel as if we're doing enough for God, we feel bad. But if we feel we've done something good for God, we feel good. And so we have this yo-yo up and down. But I want to tell you this morning, my brother, my sister, while you were yet a sinner, Christ had already died for you. 
So we don't believe to make it true. We believe because it's already true. Let me say that again. We don't believe to make the gospel true. We believe because it is already true. He's waiting for you to believe in what is already true. If you're going to clap, clap better than that. Listen. Listen. I, 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 I just, I, I asked the Lord this morning. I said, Lord, just put a deposit into someone's spirit this morning. Because God is spirit. Eye has not seen. What is your natural eye seeing? Your bank balance? Your, 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 your contract? Your, your, your car? Your house? Your, your natural? Are you seeing in that line? Are you seeing natural only? Because if you live in the natural, the thief is going to steal your whole life. Because what the thief does is he comes to Christ. He had the arrogance to come to the Savior of the world in a 40-day fast. That's the arrogance of the enemy. He's arrogant. And he comes to Christ in the middle of a 40-day fast. And he says to Christ, if you, if you notice, if you. <laughs> and so he comes to you, if you. And you don't know that you must respond in. It's not about if I, it's he has. And tell him where to get off. Because the minute he wants to make, if you, he puts you under the weight and the burden of the performance. And you must perform for him. Many Christians are performing, not for him, but you're performing to try and get to God. And listen, God's trying to get to you because He sent His Son to get to you. And He says, if you will believe in that, if you'll receive that, I'll make you a son and a daughter of God and I'm going to fill you with my Spirit because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, says Jesus, which now becomes our purpose scripture. So eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Who pastor, I get gehoor, die president say, I heard the economists say, I heard that crypto is going to tank and I heard that crypto, we hear things all the time. I heard a, 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 a voice note. I got that voice note, Pastor, and my heart just sunk. Uh, my heart is so gesuck. My, 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 the blood is so my gesuck. It's what we hear. And we go, this must be God. No, no, no. God doesn't speak only through the natural. He speaks through the spiritual. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard nor entered the heart, there it is, nor entered the heart, God puts His Spirit in your heart, nor entered the heart of man, the things that are laid up and prepared for those that love God. So when you try to live this Christian life, I've come that you might have life. In the natural only, what happens is, we start to assess everything naturally. Now it's a performance based walk and not a purposeful walk. Because you see, you can stay in purpose all your life because it doesn't matter where you find yourself circumstantially because you are alive together with Him. You are seated with Him. You are ascended with Him. It doesn't matter what the enemy is telling you. I can't move from this place all my life. Why? Because I didn't put myself here. Christ put me here when I believed. But the enemy wants to get you back to this. He says to Jesus, if you will, what? Bow to me, I'll give you these kingdoms. If you will jump off this cliff, surely they'll give you the angels to catch you. If you, I will give you bread to eat. He wants to tempt him with natural things. He only threw the natural in front of him. Now my question to you this morning is how much of the natural are you living your Christian walk? And how much of this natural assessment of your Christian walk is it affecting your joy, your peace, your, your goodness, your kindness? I can't be kind to people because I'm going through this battle. No, my brother, it's not your kindness. It's the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. It's the fruit of the Spirit because God is Spirit. So it's God's Spirit in you that comes upon you. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now He fills you in this temple. He lives in this treasure, this earthen vessel of yours. And now He wants this fruit to flow through you. We have to allow Him to, to work through us and to flow through us. And it's His glory and His power. And when people encounter Him through us, that's why Paul said, I want to know Him. Not performance, I want to know Him. And so when you are, and you, when you understand, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for He has anointed me. So you get given an anointing. Some pastors and some preachers, they get lost in this anointing. I am anointed. No, you were given an anointing. And the, the reason you were given an anointing wasn't for performance, it was for purpose. God didn't give you an anointing for performance, He gave you an anointing for purpose. Why? Because the anointing helps you to understand the fruit of the Spirit. The anointing helps you understand the joy, the love, the peace, the goodness, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control. The, the anointing does that. Jij is gesalf, broer. You don't need a pastor to come and put oil on your door. I told you last week. Because when you walk through the door jam, it's anointed. Because you are anointed. There are different gifts 
in the body. Everybody who's not in the fivefold ministry gets placed in the body. I get placed as a member in the body, but you're anointed. My gifting is different from yours. My responsibility is different from yours. My calling is different from yours, but we all have the same anointing. Why? Because you have an anointing. And what's that anointing for? Listen, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. To what? To preach. The anointing is to preach. The anointing is not to persecute. You see, religion persecutes behavior. The anointing preaches good news. Religion persecutes behavior. You must open, drink, and open, rook. All that can hear you. You straf and you can hell to can kubus. I probeer, Marty. I probeer. But if I myself cry, then I think I Peter Stuyvesant and Iso when I rook come. I go up by the cast and I brand my prat with my Marty. I drink it with my Marty. Brand my and coke. Let the single. Tabu. Yeah. Yes, and Tabi sing. You must fix yourself up, Tabu. You can't live like this, Tabu. You must stop, Tabu. You must, you must, you must. And Tabu says, I'm trying. And I don't know what to do. Paul says, I'm trying. When I find myself, I'm doing exactly the opposite of what I should be doing. But he said, how will I save myself from this wretched piece of human flesh? He said, thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God that I can put my faith in Christ. Thank God that somebody gave his life for me. Thank God for Jesus' sacrifice for me on Calvary. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. Listen, I must finish. The media says I preached too long. The media's going, we didn't say that. I just made that up. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me. That's why, young girls, you are not what Instagram says you are. You are not flesh. You are a house for the spirit. You have a flesh box, but that's not who you are. You have a you, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. That's why when you die on the natural, when your natural life leaves, when we have a funeral for you, we're all gonna have a funeral one day. And they're going to put a coffin either in the front of a church or somewhere at a, at a place. That is not, that was the, 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 the house that God gave you to live in for the time on earth. Now we, we, want to, we want to make this thing our identity. And you get a new identity in Christ. A spiritual identity that is perfect, that is holy, that is righteous, that can never lose its salvation because it wasn't yours in the first place. But yeah, in the natural, I can lose my peace, I can lose my joy, I can lose, I can get depressed, I, because the thief is going to keep you busy. Yeah. Fix yourself up. And Jesus says, while you were still a sinner, Aiden, I really died for you. Will you come across here and just believe? Will you look at me? Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Not looking unto Moses. Not looking unto Isaiah. Not looking, yes, they prophesied. Yes, they spoke things that were to come. But we don't look there. Looking unto Christ. The author, notice, the author and the finisher. And when Moses had finished writing the law, he said, now put this law besides the presence of God so he can be a witness against you. If you are feeling any condemnation against you, it's because the enemy is putting the law in front of you. And you're not, you have to tell him, Hamba, let me tell you what he has done, Satan. And you tell him where to get off. And the minute you put Christ in front of him, the Bible says it's a name that is above every other name. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And if you don't bow your knee on this earth, the Bible says you'll bow it one day and there won't be entry to you into that eternal place. Abram, the rich man, died, big chasm. Abram, well, the rich man was received into Abram's bosom because at that stage it was a type and a shadow. And he said, there's a big chasm, there's a big void. And I, 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 my lips are burning, I'm, 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 I'm parched, I'm, I'm dehydrated from this place of torment. And he said, send me back to my, to my, send me back to my, to my family because I realize now this thing that you spoke about is true. There is a, is a, there's a life after this. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And God sends no one to hell. He created hell for the rebellious angels, for Lucifer and a third of the rebellious angels. That's why the thief comes. You, the, the, uh, the pastor, should we pray now that we're seated with Christ? In of course, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Your spirit man is perfect, it's seated, but your flesh box is fighting a fight here. 
We don't fight flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and powers and rulers of the outer darkness. So you need to know how to pray, my brother. You need to know how to stand on God's Word. You need to know what Christ has done for you. You need to know when you, don't, when you have to make a decision as a businessman or as a parent or as a husband or a wife, you have to know. You have to be led by the Spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and the daughters of God. Not forced by the law. Not threatened by the law. Not threatened by the Spirit, but led by the Spirit. So as God invites people into His kingdom, how do they get into your kingdom? We believe. And when you believe, you receive what? Sonship and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes and He fills you. Now He he goes into your heart and now He says, let's start the spiritual journey. That's why the world calls it a gut feeling. But we speak about an unction. I'm led by the Spirit of God. So notice, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for He has what? Anointed me to preach good news. The gospel. You are sent on a mission. Your life mission is to preach good news. But if you don't know what Christ has done for you, you're going to feel at times I'm not worthy to preach good news because I'm not doing well. You you never did well in the first place. Let me help you. You You were a sinner from birth and until you put your faith in Christ and because of what Christ did for you, that is what makes you righteous. That is what makes you acceptable. That is what makes you holy. So when you get to this place and the enemy says, but you can't, you can't share your testimony. You can't speak to that person. You're a hypocrite. You are not your external box. Now listen to me. If you smoke, you're not going to go to hell, but you'll go to, you'll go to heaven quicker because your, your temple is going to die. If you drink uh, and your liver packs up and, you end, and your body falls over, it's because you are, you, are, you are forcing your natural life out of this place quicker, but you are not your natural life. Your body doesn't go to heaven. Your spirit goes. Because you are spirit. Are you getting something this morning? You have to learn. You can stand in the middle of the supermarket and you can be buying peanut butter and God's spirit will say to you, that person over there, talk to them. Why? Because He knows exactly what they're going through and you are filled with His Spirit. Now it's not a flaky, ooh, I need an usher and a music and an ambiance. You don't need the band. You don't need an usher. You don't need a pastor. You need what? Faith in what Christ has done in your heart. Because you have the power to put your hands on people. Why? Because you're anointed. Now, now, in closing, in closing, you don't need a prophet. Why? The prophetic is for the fivefold ministry. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, the fivefold ministry. That's for the body of Christ. That's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That's the prophet. You don't need to go to a prophet to tell you something that the Spirit of God can't tell you by yourself. Uh, let me say that again. You don't need to go to a prophet for a prophet to tell you something because the prophet is not the Holy Spirit. The prophet is a function in a fivefold ministry. The prophet doesn't, in a, listen, Hebrews chapter 1, in days gone by, God spoke to us, read your Bibles tonight, Hebrews chapter 1. In, the, in days gone by, God spoke to us by the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zach, the, your prophets. He spoke to us by the prophets. But today He speaks to us by His Son. Who is His Son? Jesus. What did His Son say? I won't leave His orphans, I'm going to send you. A helper. The Spirit of God is now in us. The Son and the Spirit are with us. You don't need a prophet. You have the prophetic word. 2 Peter 1.19. You have the prophetic word. The Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. You don't need a prophet. The prophet Christ came to the earth and He became flesh and now we've beheld His glory. Now because He came, He died, He was buried, He rose and He ascended and He sent the Holy Spirit. He will tell you Himself. You don't need a prophet to tell you. A prophet can confirm what the Spirit of God has been prompting your spirit man. But a prophet doesn't need to tell you. Oh, uh, sorry, you, uh, there's a person called John here. Yes, John, this, I, mm, I sense. Meantime, they've got a team of people that have gone into Facebook and they made John sit there. And he looks on Facebook profile and he goes, John is an engineer and he's married to Mary. Mm, John, is it, yes, you brother, the Lord tells me come here. And John runs up there, he's a visitor in the church and all the gullible Christians sit there and they go, woo, prophesy man of God, prophesy, prophesy man of God, prophesy. I feel the Lord telling me you must give a thousand dollars today in the next thousand minutes and you'll get a thousand. Says you close a clump nonsense. How your health? And then John comes forward and the, 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 the prophet goes, mm, the Lord tells me, mm, um, Mar- Mary. Oh, how did you know? Facebook. 
The Lord tells me, mm, mm. give him the fivefold ministry. And if a prophet advertises coming to town, prophetic miracle conference, what is a prophetic miracle conference? Because you are the miracle. When Christ filled you with his spirit, you are the miracle. You are the living miracle. You are the walking miracle. When Christ put his spirit in you, you are that lost coin. You are that precious coin. You, Christ put his spirit in you. Now, live, child of God, live. Walk with the Spirit of God. Walk in discernment. Walk in wisdom. Walk in victory. Walk in power. Walk in overflow. You have the right to live, child of God. You have the right to live. Jump on your feet this morning. Come on. All over this place. Come on, jump on your feet this morning. And give Jesus one more shout of praise. All over this place. Come on. Jump on your feet this morning. Stay standing this morning. I didn't even get to offer my sermon. Stay standing. Put the lights on, please. Leave the lights a bit brighter. And I said, Dangi Besukas, I said, No, I said, Don't do need so. It was just altar call. We make it private for people, but just relax. We're not doing anything funny here. Otherwise, people think we do strange. We don't do anything strange here. We're normal people. We watch rugby. Have you seen Chasing the Sun too? Watch it. It's good. I like it. But be a fluke word. Maka your work is too. Pastor, who can you have a good cake? I'm not my flesh box. I'm a spirit man. Amen. God is spirit. God is love. Listen, God is spirit and God is love. Perfect love casts out all fear. We therefore don't fear the day of judgment because He, because of love, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whomsoever, there's a lot of whomsoever's here this morning, shall believe in Him. There it is. Shall believe in Him. Not try to perform for Moses. Not try to perform for the law. Not try to perform for the church. Not try to perform for the pastor. But will believe in Him. When Moses had finished writing the law, he said, put it against the presence of, next to the presence of God so He can serve as a witness against people's sin. I will not leave you as orphans. I will send you the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you because it is now finished from that side to this side that you can become a witness. It is the greatest privilege to be used by God. To say to God, I avail myself to you. Fill me with your presence. I believe in you, Jesus. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your spirit. And allow the Spirit of God to come and live inside of you. And now what was only carnal, what was only natural, what was only natural you didn't have that but before i was born again i had no clue about the, the bible was a letter that killed now it's a letter that gives life because it's spiritual i take the words of my bible and i read it and when i read it i'm reading jesus conversation to me and the spirit of god takes the word of your page he puts it in my heart and it becomes revelation before that i had to get information religion can only give you information but anointing and relationship and the Spirit of God gives you revelation. And until you haven't moved from that side of the physical to the side of the spiritual, you're always going to try to understand your Bible, your Christian walk naturally. And my challenge to you this morning is if you will allow God's Spirit to come and live inside of you and say yes to Him. I know. I was religious. I went to church. I read my Bible. It made no sense to me. I was confirmed in my church. I told you before, God given us St. Christopher, yet I stole the wine when we needed wine when I was 16 because we ran out of alcohol, that's how religion confuses you and messes your mind up. There's no living relationship. There. It's just religion. I don't blame it. I just say it is what it is. So you might have been raised religiously. Maybe you're raised in a traditional setting like I was, traditional. Yeah. And Afrikaners, by Afrikaners, is a skort gemaak in traditie. I understand that. I'm not knocking any denomination this morning. But you can be in church, but you can still be outside of your purpose. Because until the Spirit of God hasn't entered your life and you haven't availed yourself and said, Ja, Jere, vandag, gee ek my, my life, my lichaam oor aan u en ek sê vir jou, fill me and live inside of me. I believe in you, Jesus. I put my full faith and confidence in you. Jesus said, I am the door. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. 613 ways of the Jewish laws. Wide is the road. You guys can choose of the 613. You jump around, you choose a few, you think you're right. doesn't make you right. But narrow is the way. Not difficult, but narrow. Why? Because some of you are going to find it difficult to leave your religion and grab hold of faith. But I am the door. 
And if you'll walk through this door, Jesus says, I will give you this life. I can't give you this life. CRC can't give you this life. No church can give you this life. Only faith in Christ can give you this life. And if this morning, if you will believe, religious, agnostic, atheist, whatever, if you will believe and say, yes, pastor, I believe this morning in what Jesus came to do for me. The Bible says something miraculous is going to happen. God's going to come as He does what He did to me, as He did to pastor, as He did to every pastor. And He's going to come and He's going to take His love and His mercy and His grace and His spirit and He fills you. And for the first time, you have the privilege to see something differently. Business decisions, businessmen, don't make quick or hasty decisions. Pray and get led by God's Spirit. God's going to lead you. This is the year of overflow. Listen to me. This is the year of overflow. You are entitled to walk in overflow. Don't allow the naysayers to say, yes, you have prosperity, Kak. I haven't finished my sermon. Come back next week. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for His anointing to preach the gospel to the poor. The poor in perspective, the poor in power, the poor in purse. Many people's purses, their wallets are empty because they, uh, 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 they think they're not entitled to it. Money's the least, Jesus said. But he said, if you live a life of purpose, you live a life of, of perspective, and you live a life out there in the marketplace, the Bible says, Jesus had, his, uh, he had a treasurer. He had, he, Judas had his geld gesteel, but he had geld gehad. He wore purple. He wore Gucci, Versace. Purple was a very rare color in Jesus' day. He wore purple. Why? Because he wasn't arm with the scarpy on his hand, with the stocky. No, he was a very successful person. His father was a carpenter. He worked for his dad. It wasn't Ikea. It was some of these other places. Vainans or Wellingtons or whatever. Listen to me. Don't let religion steal from you. This is not about money. It's about life. And if you have life, everything else will follow. Because you believe what? In what He did for you. And when you believe in what He did for you, everything changes. Are you here this morning? Bow your heads, close your eyes this morning. Come on. What a great presence of God all over this place. Bow your heads, close your eyes. You are the miracle. Come on. Believers praying. You stay in this place this morning saying, Pastor, this word has really spoken to my heart today. I can't really say with full assurance. I can't even follow for second I've been religious like you were, Pastor. I grew up in a church. I could, did all those things, but I realized I'm empty. I don't have this peace you speak of. I don't have this life. I know because I was there. I don't criticize you today. I just tell you factually where I was. I can tell you my testimony. I was empty, empty because I just, I was built on religion and on a relationship. And this is a relationship. And this morning you're standing here saying, I want to have this relationship with Christ. I want to receive this power. I want to receive this spirit. The Bible says to as many as received him. All I ask you this morning is to say yes. In it, yeah. I and what Jesus for me has done on the cross. I glow that he's Heilig Geest gestuurd and in my, uh, uitgestort op die aarde en as ek het aanvaar vir oogend dier geloof gaan hy vir my vul vir oogend he's going to fill your heart this morning if that is you today you're saying that's me pastor I can't say with full assurance that if I should die in the next 24 hours I'm not even sure where I'd spend eternity or perhaps you're staying in this place this morning you're saying I was serving God one time I've moved away like the prodigal son I've moved away from God's house I've moved away from that presence and I'm feeling that I'm not where I should be. But I realized this morning that I have to get back to this place. Like the prodigal son, the Bible says he left his father's house and he found himself in a place where his life was in a mess. I'm not saying your life is totally in a mess, but you could be in a spiritual vacuum this morning, just in a place where you realize you're not where you should be. You used to read your Bible, you don't anymore. You used to go to church, you don't anymore. God speaking to your heart this morning saying, come on, that's not who you are. Get back to that place. Get back to that place where you walk by the Spirit and not try to perform in the flesh. Maybe you were hurt by the church. I understand that people say they're hurting the church. I understand that. Sometimes it's because we don't understand what Christ has done for us and we're sick and tired of trying to perform. But this morning God is saying to you, come on, find that place of rest this morning. Rest in me again. Come back to that place. Let me start that work in you again. Let me continue that work in you again. And when the prodigal son came back to his father's house, the Bible said he came back with a slave mentality. And yet when his father ran to him, saw him, he hugged him, he said, son, welcome back because you are a son and a daughter of God. Don't allow the thief to steal this morning. Don't allow the thief to kill or destroy. You are a son and a daughter of God. But come back to him this morning. Say, yeah, a keer terug aan die Heere volgen. Ek wil een nieuwe begin he. I want a fresh start. I want a new beginning. Every head by every eye closed this morning. Saying, yes, pastor, that's me. I want to experience this peace with God this morning. Pray with me. Include me in your prayer this morning. It'll be my privilege and my honor this morning. That's you quickly, quietly, unashamedly. You're saying that's me, Pastor. Fit into one of those two categories. I want my heart for the year here for I want to reach out to God this morning. I want to give my life back to God. Then just pick up your hand quickly and say yes. Include me in your prayer this morning. Tell your hand top, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you at the back. I see you. And come on up, 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 thank you. Say, I want to experience the peace of God. I want to experience the peace of God. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Come. Put your hands up this morning. Say it, y'all. 
Ek wil, ek wil hier die vrede ervaar volg, and I want to experience this peace, thank you, thank you. I know, I know, I know, it takes boldness, it takes guts sometimes. Kom on, beskam. I'm not going to put you out of the spot. Thank you, sir, at the back. I see your hand. I'm not auctioning off Jesus this morning. I'm simply just acknowledging people. Tell you, Anton, boy, you Just above your shoulder. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Come. I know, I know. There's a wrestle. There's a wrestle. Don't allow the wrestle. Don't allow the thief to steal now. The thief only comes but to steal, killing the story. Yeah, I saw myself just going to rach maak. I will just be a seeker mark. I know that I was there for years and years and years. I thought, let me first go next week, next week, next week. No. Now, now the time for salvation is. I'm not asking you to join this church. I'm simply asking you to make a decision in your heart to say, yes, I believe this morning and I receive him into my heart. Last of all, for a bit, you wanted to put your hand up, but you didn't, but the Lord is speaking to your heart this morning. Put it up. Understand. Forget the person next to you right now. Forget your husband. Forget your wife. Forget the people right now. What's what God thinks about you? Say, yeah. Say, yeah. For all kind of you be slain. Last of all, for a bit. Come. Thank you at the back, sir. I see your hand. Come. Tell you on the balcony. Thank you. Come. Come. Thank you. Put your hands down this morning. I want to pray with you in a moment. And we're going to celebrate with you this morning as you make this decision and if you put your hands up this morning you're in this place you're saying yes this message is spoken in my heart pastor again I say to you I'm not asking you to join the church I'm asking you simply to make a decision this morning and to say yes to him if that's you all over this place you're saying yes pastor I want to make that decision perhaps you brought your mother your father your brother your sister wait to church this morning your love your encouragement can help that person make a decision so don't stand there this morning with any guilt or any condemnation. You're not here because you are wrong. You're here because He has made it right for us. And if you put your faith in Him this morning, so why don't you turn to your friend, your mother, your father, your brother, and say, come on, I'll walk with you. Your love, your encouragement can help that person make a decision. Then take, do me a favor. Take your personal belongings, your handbag, your Bible, your cell phone, so it doesn't get lost. And I want you to take right now a step of faith and leave your seat. Come and join me at the altar. And we're going to pray together for you. We're going to cheer you on like heaven is. Come and make that decision this morning. Come and receive your freedom. Come. Come and receive your freedom. Come on, family. Clap your hands this morning and welcome them as they come. 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 Leave your seat. Come. Just walk. Just walk. Just walk. Walk boldly. Come on, walk. 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 Come on, cheer them on. Cheer them on. Cheer them on. Come on, leave your seat, leave, come, come, come. You're walking for me, walk for yourself, come. Turn to your friends, I'll walk, come. Come on, leave your seat, come, come, come. Come, cheer them on, yeah, they're still coming, people are still coming, come, come, come. My sins are forgiven. Say today, I believe. My future is heaven. I praise God. Come, come. Oh, what he's done. Oh, what he's done. What he's done. Oh, what he's done. Come, come. Oh, the glory and the honor to the sun. Come on, family. Cheer them on. Cheer them on. Cheer them on. My future is heaven. I praise God. Come on, God loves you, man. God loves you. Come. Come on, I'll wait for you. 30 seconds. Come. You want to come? Leave your seat. Come. My future is heaven. I just sense in my spirit this morning, you're standing in this place, you're saying, well, I should have walked. Why I say it? Because I did this often. I should have walked, but I didn't. What can he mean? Forget what he means to say. But I sense in my spirit this morning, you're standing here, maybe a young couple. Both of you being, not going through marital challenges, but you, you just, you, you can't really live, but you know it. There's, a, there's, a, there's something that has to change or shift in your family. I believe it's God's spirit talking to you this morning, saying, come. I did a wedding yesterday. I married uh, Ruan and Liani yesterday, and I said to them, I said, when we, when we started on this journey of marriage, I said, it's all, you know, it's wedding days and it's romantic and it's great. I said, we have to build this thing. And I said, if you don't build your marriage on God's word and on the church and being plugged in the church, it becomes a very difficult place. And sometimes we, we have good intentions when we start, but then we, uh, you know, life gets to us and we fizzle out. We just go through the motions. Then our children come. And today your children are being told everything other than truth. A woman is a man and a man is a woman and all these things. Gender identity crisis. And if you haven't got 
the word of God to base your life on, you're going to be like a ship that's at sea. That's why I say to you, plug your life into a church like this, not because this church, any other church that's a, a good church, plug your life into that church. But build your life upon the rock of Christ and build your kids on the truth of Christ. But I sense in my spirit, 30 seconds, I'm just, I just sense in my spirit, you're saying then, the Lord's saying yes. If you're the husband, direct your hands, your vrouw's hand and say, Liffy, come. For all can we have a slate mark. For all can we have a slate mark. If there's anybody in this house this morning, that's you. You're saying a married couple. I'm talking about a married couple. God's speaking to you this morning. Come. I want you to bring your wife. I want you to bring your husband. Say, come. Together this morning, we're going to make this commitment to God. Come. 30 seconds. If that's you, just walk this morning. Leave your seat. Say yes. If there's anybody here this morning, come. I want to pray with you. We're going to build our house on this rock of Christ. Leave your seat right now. Come, come, come. Come, come, come. Come, come. come. There's more of you, I know. There's more of you. Come, come. Come, come. My future is here. Come, come. I praise God. Come, leave me. Come. Leave your seat. Come. I know, I know. Come. Fight your man's hand. Fight your pro hand. Say, come. Vandaag, walk ons op een slijt. Ons bou, ons hevelik, ons lewe, ons kinders op die woord van God. God is ons fondatie. Come, come. There's more of you, I know. Come. I don't care if you've been married for 50 years, for 20 years. Take your wife's hand. Say, today we make this decision. Come. Fight your man's hand. Fight your pro's hand. Come. 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 Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for your boldness of stepping out of your chair. I say it takes guts to step out of your chair. But I want to say to you that I believe as you made that walk of faith today, God's going to do a whole fresh new thing in your marriage. He's going to take your relationship, your life, all of you this morning. Not because you, if you could be there as well. But I say this to us. Don't allow the enemy to let the person of your marriage, when you got married, that person that you love with all your heart, now become the enemy of your life. Don't allow the thief to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's build our marriages on the Word of God, the solid rock of Christ. The, the, the hardest thing to do is to say sorry. And Christ is the example. He said what? Father, forgive them. Forgive your husband, forgive your wife. Let's reconcile. Let's get back to that place. Sharon and I are celebrating 30 years this year of marriage. Has it been easy? No. Has it been possible? Yes, because with God all things are possible. Amen. So they ask us, Pastor, do you and Pastor Sharon ever fight? I said, no. Well, we do still fight, but we just throw the pots and pans around in order now. They used to be disordered, the biggest pot to the smallest, and now we, you know, we used to throw all pots and now we throw them in order. So it gets better, but it's 30 years of, of God's goodness. Amen. Put your hands on your heart this morning. Pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I believe and receive you into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior. I avail my temple for you. Fill me with your spirit. Open up my heart to you. Lead me from today by your Spirit. Guide us into all truth. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise that is due to you. Jesus, Jesus, say, say Jesus, help me to tell others of what you have done for us, for me, all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.